Hello, I am Amy Batson, Executive Director of Women Lift Health. Welcome to the fifth annual Women Leaders in Global Health Conference. Thank you for joining us today on this exciting day as we gather from around the globe to reimagine leadership together. As the world continues to face uncertainty, disruption, and massive inequalities all exacerbated by COVID-19, one thing is perfectly clear. Leadership matters. Over these next two days, we hope to crack open the conversation and challenge traditional notions of what leadership needs to look, sound, and act like to drive forward transformative change. These sessions will include finding practical, tangible ways to center women's voices and perspectives at decision-making tables to improve health and achieve gender equality. Marking the conference's fifth year, we've intentionally focused on action, adding more interactive elements to the agenda. We hope that you strengthen a skill at one of our workshops, connect with a colleague at a networking session, learn from another leader, be inspired by a spotlight speaker, or simply enjoy a poetry reading. Whichever path you choose, we welcome you to jump in with both feet and participate. As a community, we share the goal of expanding the power and the influence of talented women leaders. Because as we believe at Women Lift Health, when women lead, better health follows. With that, Let's open WLGH 2021. Welcome to me, Macabo, our MC today. Amy, thank you so, so very much. It is my absolute pleasure to be joining you. I'm in Johannesburg, and what a thrill it is with technology that we're able to join from wherever in the world you are. I don't speak all the global languages, but I suppose I could say uh, Bienvenue, I could say Dumelang, Sanbonani, Nihao to all of you, wherever in the world you may be joining. As I said, it isn't just a thrill and an opportunity to, to be here today, but I think it's really poignant when we have the opportunity to take a moment to think, to reflect, and also to try to find great and unique, interesting ways to bolster and support and encourage women, particularly when it comes to the question of health. I'm going to be your guide. Some people call them an MC for the afternoon and for the day. And as we go along, you will have to be moving from one platform to another. So before we do absolutely anything else, just a few housekeeping notes. If you do have any technical issues, you can get in touch with live support staff using the technical support channel that's in the chat box. Um, remember that all of our sessions are recorded and they are embedded on the platform. So you'll be able to go back uh, to the recordings even after the fact. The main stage sessions are only available um, will be available and they're available in either French or Spanish interpretation, only those two. Um, and to access that, you can uh, use the uh, Escenario principle for Spanish or, or Sen Principal for the French. So that's Escenario Principale for the Spanish and Sen Principal for the French. Just uh, one more thing, there will be closed captioning also available, that is in English only. And to enable this, just click the CC button that appears at the bottom of your video player. So I'm going to leave it there for now. Actually, you know, one more thing, just remember that at the end, when you are moving from the main plenary session, you will have to leave the plenary on your screen and you will then be able to go back to the agenda and select the session which you want to join. We seem to have a problem with Toomey's feed just right now, um, but we're looking forward now. Maybe we can come back and uh, move on to our first session. We're so excited to have uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Monica Gangos, the First Lady of Namibia, speaking with us, with Toomey, on a fireside chat. Thank you. Madam First Lady, an absolute, absolute pleasure to have you join us today. I've been really looking forward to our conversation um, and I can't wait to be able to share the insights that you have. I know in just a moment, we're gonna have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about the theme of the conference, Reimagining Leadership, 
But before we do that, I'd like to step back a little bit um, and to give us a sense, perhaps, if you would, what is it that served as the catalyst? What, where did your journey around leadership and becoming not just the lawyer that you became, but the businesswoman that you became, where did that journey really in earnest begin for you? Thanks to me. It's such a privilege to be um, interviewed by you. I really regard you as one of the best. So I'm, I'm happy to be in this seat. Um, and to answer your question, about where did it begin, where did this um, realization come from? Um, it, it, it really came quite early where one of the le lessons that I saw very quickly is that no matter who you, you are in which sector you are, but there's a point in your career where you can see this upward trajectory. And no matter how perfect you are, you are going to have to endure some form of patriarchal behavior, some form of gendered insults, um, slurs against you and this is true no matter how wholesome you conduct yourself um, and the reaction I noticed is usually an embarrassed silence or everyone who's advising you um, not to respond to ignore it and, and the lesson I learned what changed my style of leadership is where I realized but silence really does not protect me um, so one thing I practice a lot uh, particularly now as first lady because there's there's fewer consequences for me to speak up, is that to speak up not only for myself, but for others. Because I know that there's other women in leadership who want to speak out, but they, they, there may be consequences for them. Um, and for us who are in a position to speak up on behalf of others, we should. Um, and when we can call out behavior that impacts us, we should also do that. Was there, it's interesting that you say that because when I was preparing for our conversation, I, I noticed that it almost was a theme within, within the things that you spoke about, that you kind of got to a moment where, you're done, where you said sort of, I'm kind of done tolerating this, I'm, I'm really quite done. And although perhaps being first lady gave you a platform to do so with a little bit less at risk, speaking out wasn't started by you becoming first lady. So was there a moment, was there an incident, was there a situation that actually made you say this far and no further? It's, it's never an event. Um, it's never really um, a moment. It's, a, it's this process. It's, it's tolerating so much until you really can't um, and not always getting support, um, even sometimes from the institution that you work for, um, where they'll take a public stand and protect you. And, and, and that moment is really the moment where you realize, but I'm really in this on my own. And if I'm not going to do something, nobody's actually going to, to do this for me. Um, and as I, I, I always as, as a first lady, I have unearned uh, privilege. I have social capital I have not worked for. In all of my other career paths, I was the managing director of the largest private equity fund in, in, in the country. I was on the president's economic advisory council. I was the chairman um, of, a, of, of a commercial bank. All of those roles I earned. Um, this one as first lady, I didn't. Um, so the very least that I can do is to spend some of the social capital that I have um, in, in, in furtherance of things that I wouldn't have been able to do as the chairman of a bank. Um, I would have been in a bit of a straitjacket. I would need to be a bit more careful. Um, so, so that's probably the moment, that moment when I realized, but it, it's going to take, it's going to cost me less to see some of the things that I talk about relative to other women who are prominent, um, who are experiencing the same thing I'm experiencing. Uh, but there will, there may be professional or political consequences for them um, to tackle some of these issues head on. Let's talk a little bit about about that space in the in the boardroom. Um, I have been myself privileged enough to to serve on a few boards, and and one of the challenges I think is that historically people said women need a, a, a seat at the table, right? For a long, long time, we need to get in the boardroom. We need to have a seat at the table. That will change a lot. We have seats at the table, but that hasn't necessarily changed a lot in terms of the societal construct around how women. Uh, can or cannot, may or may not conduct themselves. What is it then that needs to change in that boardroom environment or in the boardroom space that actually affects real 
and sustained change for the way in which women are incorporated in society? So the boardroom is a reflection of the society it operates in. So if the society is patriarchal um, and has harmful gender stereotypes about women, then certainly in the boardroom you'll be treated um, within those biases. So, so deal with the problem and not the symptoms. The boardroom is a symptom um, of larger societal issues pertaining to patriarchy um, and women's roles um, at the leadership table. But very specific to boardrooms, what I noticed there's a certain power dynamic around the table where there's always one or two directors who determine the pace and the tone of the conversations that's being held and the decisions that are being taken. And, and, and part of that also relates to who owns these companies. Um, where does the capital flow towards? And that's why it's critical for me that we not just talk about political leadership, which is important, but also economic leadership. Who owns the economy? And are women represented, represented at the table um, of, um, of those who own the equity of these companies? Because that determines how a boardroom table looks like. I think that then brings us quite nicely to the question of how we now begin to think and converse differently about leadership, reimagining leadership. So when, when we say to you, there's this conference and the theme of the conference is reimagining leadership, what does that mean to you? Um, and you're right. What does it mean to me? Because I think it means different things to different people. Um, if you ask that to a man, if you ask it to um, a black woman, if you ask it to somebody from the LGBT plus community, um, we'll all have different um, answers. So as an so African woman, um, what leadership looks like to me, reimagined leadership, is really what we've always been asking for. Um, it's leadership that has the ability to match our uh, most complex problems with our best brains. And I think the political system globally has not managed to do that. Um, and leadership, uh, reimagined leadership to me is what we've been talking about. It's a leadership that is inclusive, um, a leadership where I recognize myself um, and where my needs. Um, as an African woman, are, are respected, taken into consideration, um, and become part of whatever decision making um, happens on my behalf. So then my next question is, if we look at the notion of reimagining leadership, what about leadership itself? What does that mean to you? So, so leadership, to me, it means being authentic. Um, it means being true to yourself and, and, and having the same views in the public sphere as you do in private. Um, I've seen many leaders say one thing in public, but when you meet them in private, um, it's a totally different thing that they believe in. And I always find those leaders to be somewhat dangerous because in moments like this, like when we're dealing with um, um, a pandemic like COVID-19, where difficult decisions need to be taken. Um, leaders who are not grounded, who do not have confidence in themselves and their abilities, tend to be blown by the wind. And, and you don't want a leader, particularly in times of crisis, um, who isn't wise, um, who doesn't have capacity, who is not inclusive, and who is inclined towards uh, populist inclinations that maybe work in the short term, but are disastrous in the long term. And, and we've seen populist leaders and how their leadership has panned out um, in their management of COVID-19, for instance. What is really interesting when you, when you talk about leadership and, and the grounding question um, is that there's been this increasing appreciation and understanding that having women in leadership in the boardroom, having them in leadership positions, regardless of whether it's the public or private sector or wherever it is, it fundamentally changes the, the pr trajectory of, of, of communities and of societies and of corporations, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the case for needing to have women in leadership has been made. The challenge, however, remains women wanting to take up the leadership role, because as yeah. you've mentioned, even though there are many of us who can say, yes, we understand what the problem is, that lived reality every day in the boardroom, having to fight that battle, 
is not always an easy one to do. How, as women, without sort of suggesting a one size fits all, how as women do we begin to not dismantle, but how do we begin to penetrate that space in a way that we can, so to speak, take up more space? So that question really triggers me um, to me because it, it, it makes me think of all the microaggressions that you face um, at all levels, um, no matter how high up in the food chain you are. Um, and, and it made me think exactly why I had made that video about online uh, bullying. Uh, because part of it is about speaking up and speaking up for each other um, and recognizing that we can't continue to be silent, but from a more personal perspective, from my perspective, it, it, it's, it's looking back um, and almost costing how much this leadership journey has cost me in terms of um, friendships, in terms of um, a romantic relationship, in terms of uh, raising children or even having children in the first place. I know many women um, around about my age who, who can't have children anymore, not because they never wanted to. They were just waiting for this perfect spouse or for their lives to settle down. And then the issue of family just, um, it was never a convenient discussion. So, so we make so many sacrifices when we end up in the front page of newspapers um, and we are being insulted left, right and center in a very gendered way. Um, our partners, our children, our, our, our loved ones need to find a way to also accept that that's part of the role um, that we occupy. So there is a, there is a unfortunately, I wish I, 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 I could sugarcoat this, but there is a price right now to women's leadership. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that the more we speak out about the things that need to be changed, um, the more incentivized younger women are to actually enter these spaces. Because one thing that concerns me is that if I allow myself to be abused and to be mistreated and, and just constantly pay this leadership price, um, younger, more energetic, more capable women will be looking at it and saying, but if this is what Monica is going through, do I really want this for yeah. myself? Exactly. And I think for, for, for many of us, um, um, you, we're often, if you're in the public eye, the question often comes, when are you doing this and when are you doing that? And, and even though one recognizes that there is a gap or a space, um, the price, it's expensive, right? The price that, you, that you're going to pay to do that is, is very much higher than many of our male counterparts have to deal with. Not just that, but the environments are, aren't friendly. So even policies within the workplace and within these envi uh, environments don't allow women to be the, the, the mother and the nurturer and the caregiver, which many women have to straddle both, both worlds. So, so if we were then to say, all right, we now want to try to help young people to do this, young women in particular, is there a, a sort of a five steps that you don't necessarily have to follow verbatim, but can serve as a bit of a guide around how to navigate entry into spaces where um, one knows it's going to be hard fought? So I certainly, um, so these spaces, um, whether it's in um, economic spaces or political spaces, are full of landmines and just taking a wrong step blows this landmine up and and you with it so one of to me one of the steps would certainly having somebody next to you who understands the map of that space and where those landmarks are located um, so that you don't make mistakes that have already been made um, so the, the the mentorship the the, the guiding um, the ability to have private conversations with somebody um, who already occupies um, a space at the table and who can advocate on your behalf when you're not there um, is critical. Uh, but in addition to that is also the, the funding for women's leaders. I, I just look in the political space how expensive it is um, to get into elected office. And often the people who control the purse strings about who funds which political candidate are men. And if we're looking to assist women, it has to go beyond just mentorship. It, it has to go into the funding um, of the 
aspirations as well. Um, another thing that I find quite important, um, and I see it happening a lot with um, younger African women who've become um, activists and what they do well is that they are very aggressive in how they challenge some of these issues that are faced by women in the public space, whether they like these women um, or not. So I think that's an important um, space that needs to be more occupied by women, and that's that of activism. I think we, we leave this hard work um, to feminists. So even women who don't identify as feminists certainly do benefit from the work um, that is done by feminists simply because they are so uncompromising. Um, in what many people have accepted as normal. Um, so there's a couple of others that I, I, I don't want to go too deep into detail, but that, those to me are quite interesting. I, is, I, th I find it quite interesting when you talk in particular about um, the feminist question and then the LGBTQ um, community and, and the fact that there's almost been or had to be sort of a sacrificial process where people have just said, I'm going to do this because those who come after me have to find something better. Um, and, and a lot of women, and, and in some instances, a lot of men um, have, have had to pay very, very steep prices. Yes. Is there at all a way in which networks that um, contain and support women can, can function at different levels within the organization so that women are not, so that there's not an either or, so you don't have to choose your family and be supportive, but you don't necessarily have to become the leader of the party. You can still be in the background and make an impact um, and still have the rest of your life. Is there a room for rethinking how we structure the support systems for women in order to begin making more and deeper impact around women in leadership? Yes, there is. Um, I just don't know if it's going to stop uh, this generation of women leaders um, from, from still having to pay a price. Um, I think those are going to be um, the dividends that will be uh, earned by the generation that comes after us. Um, I think there's still going to be a price to pay for some time. And, and, and this topic is so wide, whether it's about... Um, assisting with childcare, um, uh, not being looked at strangely if you go away for, to resolve uh, family issues. I know often how many times I had to um, leave family holidays so I can come back to the office to sort out a crisis, not because um, anybody told me to, but simply because I, I knew how things are structured, that that's just what you have to do. Um, and and uh, it takes time to me. I, I just look at, um, in your country, how Winnie Mandela's legacy is being redefined by a younger generation of women who understand the price um, that she paid, whereas a few years ago, that wasn't the case. Um, I, I look in America. Um, the other day, I saw a CNN program with Monica Lewinsky and how her, 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 her story is being retold primarily by herself, but also by a new understanding of what that power dynamic um, yeah. entails. Um, so I do think with time and as we change um, mindsets, especially problematic mindsets about women's roles, we will start to reevaluate what it means to be supportive um, to women who are in the public sphere. I know that um, a lot of this work you've also been working to do or trying to do through your Be Free movement. Um, and also when you were working uh, specifically on HIV AIDS related issues, that all of this kind of had this thread of, of how to better support um, women and adolescent girls in particular um, to try to, to sort of shore up that foundation, if I can put it that way, um, so that whatever was coming up had, had some kind of stability to grow on. We only have a few minutes left, believe it or not. I can't believe how much the time has flown. Um, if we were to now say in the next year or two, through whether it's a conference such as this one, through our individual efforts, through your Be Free movement, whatever platform we may have available to us, what are the two important things that you think we as women need to do to try to begin changing um, the temperature to try to begin changing uh, and reimagining 
how that leadership can be. Because to your point, we can't do it all at once, but we can do things that, that, that we can change in our own spheres that add to the whole. So the one um, I would certainly think is speaking out. Um, and I dare to say no matter the cost. Because that's, <laughs> and, and, and it, that's a tough it, ask, though. That's a really it, tough ask. It is a tough ask, but we also ask ourselves, how does it look like now? Um, and if, so there's a cost either way. Silence comes at a cost. Speaking out comes at a cost. But if you know that speaking out ultimately will change this path for somebody else, um, then I'd rather pay the cost of speaking out. Um, and what I've, I've started to do more often is that also speak out for others, um, for other women. When you see another woman being unfairly attacked, you must know that your day is coming. So when you're protecting her, you're not just protecting her, you're protecting yourself against similar attacks in future. Because by keeping quiet, you, you enable and you give permission for this environment um, to sustain itself. So that would probably be the first thing. Um, the second thing is I've, I've, I've been in many spaces, uh, both in the political space and the economic space, where a, a wrong decision that would disproportionately impact women was fought against by somebody at that table. Um, and that more of us become those people who are in spaces where decisions are made and who put up their hands and say, but we, this is wrong and this is going to negatively impact women or children. Um, and, and a good example would be COVID-19 and how all these economic recovery plans were crafted. Um, they were funded, but critical gaps were left. Um, in Namibia, we're seeing teenage pregnancies double. Um, and that means we are assuming the HIV infection rates of adolescent girls and young women are going to continue remaining a problem. We saw women's access to reproductive health um, collapsing. And, and we need somebody who's at that table where these funding decisions are made who says, hold on, we're missing something here. And we cannot talk about uh, economic recovery. We're not talking about women's health. And our women are generally disproportionately impacted by crisis, including COVID-19. So those are probably the two things that I'd say. Speak up, if not for yourself, for others. Uh, number two, um, the spaces that you occupy, make sure that nobody's left behind and speak up for those who are not at the table. And I guess to your point, be okay being labeled as the one who's going to cause or make trouble because somebody has to make the trouble at some point anyway. Absolutely. I, I, I take it as a, as a compliment when somebody calls me a troublemaker. Um, <laughs> to me, it's not a bad word. It's a good word. Uh, it means I'm doing something. If nobody calls me a troublemaker, then I haven't done my job. And you think <laughs> you haven't been doing what you were supposed to be doing, right? So you need to get back on the table and cause some trouble. <laughs> Your excellency, <laughs> Mrs. Monica Gengos, uh, the First Lady of Namibia. It's been an absolute pleasure, an absolute pleasure being able to speak with you. Can you believe it? Our time is pretty much up. I hope uh, certainly that you have uh, enjoyed sharing the pearls of wisdom that you have with us. I've certainly enjoyed hearing um, them. And perhaps more importantly, I'm really looking forward to seeing exactly how much trouble not only are you going to be causing, but how much trouble you're going to be getting into. Because I think there are many of us who are standing around the sidelines, and particularly at this conference, who are just itching to make some mischief. Yeah, no, no, we must all get into a little bit more trouble and, and the world will be a better place. And thanks for a great interview. I really enjoyed having this chat with you. No, thank you very much. And we wish you much speed. I mean, you're, you're, you're certainly an inspiration for me. And I think many of those who are watching certainly feel inspired by your comments and your remarks today. Please keep the fires burning. Keep, please keep fighting the good, the good fight. And uh, yes, I like the fact that we need to go and cause more trouble. So let's get straight to it once again. Thanks to me.